Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. This morning's sermon will focus on the appearance of the angel and then the heavenly host to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem. We will read the text, and then I want to explain two things about the text, and then we'll get into our outline. Luke chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 20. Excuse me, this is Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. May God bless the reading of his word. Now I want to explain two things about the text which we've just read, and then our outline will have five short points after that. The two things I want to explain are, first of all, it talks about Joseph and Mary going up to Jerusalem, going up to Judea, and to Bethlehem, excuse me, not to Jerusalem, but, and that always confused me uh, when I was younger because they're coming from Nazareth in Galilee, which is to the north of Judea, and so they're traveling southward, they're traveling south from Galilee down to Judea, and so it always confused me, why does it say that they are going up, that they are traveling upward? And the reason is that this word up is relative to elevation, It's not relative to north versus south, but relative to low versus high. We have to remember that the Jordan River and the Jordan Valley down to the Dead Sea is extremely low. Indeed, the Dead Sea is below sea level. And so if you travel from Jericho down below sea level up to Jerusalem, it's actually a distance of a difference of 2,500 feet you have to ascend 2,500 feet to go from Jericho up to Jerusalem, which is why we have Psalms of Ascent. As the people of Israel ascend from the Jordan Valley up to Jerusalem, they are going up a mountain. They are going up a hillside to Jerusalem. And that's why it talks about Joseph and Mary going up to Judea. In the previous chapter, in Luke chapter 1, it says in, verses, in verse 65, 
uh, that when Mary went to visit Elizabeth and when John the Baptist was born, it says these things were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. So Judea and Bethlehem is an elevated hilly region or area of Israel, and that's why it refers to them or speaks of them as going up to Bethlehem. Now, the second thing that I want to explain about the text before we get into our outline is the appearance of the glory of the Lord all around the shepherds. In our text, it says that the glory of the Lord appeared around them. The glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds. And we need to understand what this is describing or what this is referring to as much as possible. It's actually very difficult to describe this, but we're going to do our best. You have to, first of all, appreciate the darkness of the night. Uh, here in Southern California, we have a very, very sad night. It is truly not night at all. The city lights of our region pollute the sky with light so that we hardly see any stars whatsoever, and it diminishes our appreciation for what true night is like. For example, when, if you're from Southern California, from the LA region, and you read that God created the sun to rule the day and the moon as the lesser light to rule the night, you'd say, I don't understand, the moon doesn't do anything. <laughs> but if you're in true night, true darkness, without any electricity whatsoever, the moon and the stars are the only light that you would have, and they truly do when the moon, especially when it's full, truly does light up the landscape beneath it. So we are told that the shepherds were guarding their flock by night. The narrative tells us that this took place at night in the true darkness of night where the only lights are moon and stars and perhaps a campfire of some sort. And it's in this profound darkness that the glory of the Lord appeared and shone around them. Now, the glory of the Lord is a very specific phenomenon, a very specific thing that happened, or a very spe specific thing that they saw. The glory of the Lord is a light and a glory that you cannot find and you cannot see in the visible world that has been created and in which we live. It is a light from heaven. It is an otherworldly light. This glory of the Lord appears throughout the scriptures, however. For example, the glory of the Lord passed by Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses beheld the glory of the Lord as it passed him by. The scriptures also tell us that the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud to lead Israel by day and night. It also tells us that the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud between the cherubim above the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. We also read in the prophets such as Isaiah and Ezekiel about the glory of the Lord and the visions that Isaiah had of the glory of the Lord filling the temple or Ezekiel's visions of the glory of the Lord gleaming. How is it described? How is the, the glory of the Lord described? Well, it's described as being like fire in intensity. Fire gleams and burns brightly in a, in a in a sort of moving kind of light. It's not just a fixed, steady light, but it's a, it's a pulsing sort of light. But it's also not like fire, because fire has hues of red and orange and yellow and white, but that's all. Whereas the scriptures tell us that the glory of the Lord is prismatic and iridescent. By prismatic, I mean it has all of the colors of the rainbow. It's, the, it's rainbow light that gleams and pulses and shines and shimmers. It's an iridescent or a prismatic iridescence. Now, that's what I mean when I say it's a light that's not in this world. It's a light that we don't naturally see. It's a light you can't go find the glory of the Lord in some place here in this world which we inhabit. It's an otherworldly light. It's a heavenly glory. It's the glory of the Lord. So imagine you're a shepherd in the quiet darkness of night. And suddenly, a bright light shines around you, and it's not just any light, it's an otherworldly light. It's a light that you've never seen before in your entire life. It's a light that's brighter and purer and yet more colorful and amazing and brilliant and dazzling than anything you've ever experienced. The darkness is overcome by the light. The shadows are chased away by the colors of the rainbow. And at the same time, an angel appears. How would you respond? 
you would respond like just about everyone else in the history of the scriptures. They, they basically faint. They're terrified. It says that they, the scriptures say that the shepherds were filled with great fear. They were shocked and surprised. They were terrified. What is this? And that's why the angel immediately says here and in so many other places, fear not, do not be afraid. I bring to you good tidings of great joy. And then a multitude of the heavenly host appears. It says, suddenly appeared, and in unison they declared glory to God in the highest. It's a good thing that there were multiple shepherds, because if it was one shepherd, he probably would have said, did that really just happen? Well, as we study these verses, we, we might think it's a very simple text, and it is a rather straightforward text. The Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Shepherds are told about it. They go visit him and see him, and then they leave rejoicing. And indeed, the narrative is straightforward and fairly simple. But the meaning of these things is monumental, of course. The impact of the incarnation reaches to all creation. Would you consider then with me five, five points, five points as we learn from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In the first place, Jesus is Savior, Christ, and Lord. Jesus is Savior, Christ, and Lord. When the angel appeared to the shepherds, he announces to them good news of great joy. What is the good news that he is declaring? He tells them specifically, a child has been born. And then he ascribes three titles to this child. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Three titles applied to the boy Jesus, to the child Jesus. Jesus is a Savior. Jesus is Christ. Jesus is Lord. So think about those three titles with me briefly. Jesus is a Savior. To be a savior or to speak of salvation implies something, implies to be saved from something. It implies there's some kind of danger, some kind of difficulty. If someone came to you right now and said, I'm here to bust you out of prison, it wouldn't make sense because you're not in prison. So if Jesus is a savior, why is salvation needed? Well, Gabriel already told Mary why. He said, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people. From what? From their sins. Jesus is a savior who saves his people from their sins. Are these good tidings of great joy? That Jesus is a savior and a savior of sinners? Indeed, because this is man's greatest need and his most impossible one. Jesus is not here to save the Jews from their political enemies. Jesus is not here to save the Jews from all of their physical um, ailments. Yes, he heals to, to demonstrate who he is, but he is a savior of sinners. Jesus is savior. But how do we know that this Jesus is a savior? He's a man. He's, he's a child. He's a little human being. But the angel says he's not just any man. He is the Christ. He is Messiah, the anointed one of God. To be the Christ or to be the Messiah, to be the anointed one means that this child is the offspring of David, not just any offspring of David, but the promised faithful offspring of David. Just to I'm going to condense a great deal of history and revelation down into a few phrases to describe what it means to be the Christ. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a covenant with David and promised David that one of his sons would sit on a throne that is established forever. One of his sons will have an everlasting king kingship. But God also told David that David's sons must be faithful or else they will be cut off, or else their throne will not be established. 
And so the history of Israel is a history of waiting for that faithful son of David to arrive, whose throne will be established forever. Where is the faithful son of David? And so there are many Christs. There are many messiahs. David is Christ. His son Solomon is Christ. All of the Davidic kings are Christs. They are all messiahs. But the Old Testament is longing for that perfect son of David, that perfect and faithful king. And so the angel here is not just saying this is a Christ. This is the Christ. This is the anointed one of God. This is the most perfect Messiah that the Old Testament narrative longs for, that the Old Testament prophets predict, that the Davidic covenant promised. This child is Savior. This child is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the faithful and perfect eternal king and son of David, David's greater Lord. And notice that David's, uh, the lineage, the Davidic lineage of Jesus is emphasized in this narrative. It tells us that Joseph was of the house of David and goes to the city of David because he's of the line of David. Jesus is Savior and Christ. And the Psalms tell us about this Christ. They describe the Davidic king fighting for his people, rescuing them from their enemies, and bringing them into a place of peace and rest. He defeats the enemies of his people. He rescues them. He saves them. But we find that this Christ defeats their spiritual enemies and saves them from their sins, saves them from hell, not from Rome. It is this child who will have an everlasting kingdom and an eternal throne. The angel tells the shepherds, today, this very day, in the city of David has been born the eternal king, the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. Now we might ask, how do we know he's a savior? Well, because he's the Christ, and that's what the Christ does. He saves his people. But how, will we, how do we know that this son of David will be faithful? That's the question of the Old Testament. Where's the faithful son of David? There are many Christs. There are many sons of David. How do we know that this one will be different? He's not just Savior. He's not just Christ. The angel says he is the Lord. He is not just any child of David. He is God in the flesh. He is Jehovah. All of David and all his kingly sons were anointed ones. They were Christ. They were Messiahs. They were earthly saviors. But they were not eternal kings. They were not God in the flesh. This son of David is the Lord This son of David is David's Lord. This son of David is Jehovah in human form. This son of David is the Lord of Israel, now born unto Israel according to the flesh. Now, if there's anything that's good news, it's to know that this son of David is God. He, therefore, will be the perfect Savior. He, therefore, will be the everlasting Savior. He, therefore, will bring everything to completion and fulfillment that that Israel and the world have been longing for. This is the best news. Unto us, this day, in the city of David, has been born God in the flesh, Son of God and Son of David. Good tidings of great joy. Jesus is Savior, Christ. And Lord. Secondly, in the second place, we see in these verses that God gives our faith specific signs. God gives our faith specific signs. Look at verse 12 with me. <clears throat> the angel says to the shepherds, And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. The the angel announces something, the birth of this child in the city of Bethlehem. And then the angel gives a specific sign whereby the, 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 excuse me, the shepherds can identify this child. This child who is Savior Christ and Lord is newly born this day. And he has been laid in a manger. Now, to find a child in Bethlehem is not at all strange. There are many children, maybe even that day, who had been born in Bethlehem. But to find a child laid in a manger, now this is strange. This is unheard of. This is specific. And in verse 20, 
it says that the shepherds went away from there, marveling at the fact that they were told something so specific and had seen exactly what had been proclaimed to them. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. They said, they were saying, The angel told us there would be a child born today and laid in a manger. We went, and that's exactly what we saw. The precise fulfillment of the, of the precise words led them to magnify and praise God for giving such a specific sign and fulfilling such a specific sign. Now, what I want us to learn from this is that this is what God does for all his people. God calls us to faith. God commands faith. But he commands faith in specific signs. God does not command us to believe in some abstraction, in some generic, I don't know what. God says, believe in this specifically. God calls us to believe, therefore, in the incarnation. God in the flesh. In the crucifixion of God incarnate, in the resurrection of God incarnate, in the ascension of God incarnate, in the session or sitting down of God incarnate, Jesus Christ the Lord. Notice how specific those signs are. God gives unto our faith incarnation, God in the flesh, crucifixion, a specific kind of death, resurrection from the dead, another miracle, ascension into heaven and session at the right hand of the Father. Our faith is given explicit and specific signs in which we ought to and must believe. Such things are not to be doubted, but believed. And this is a wonderful thing. As the, as the shepherds rejoiced, God said specifically this, and that's what they believed and rushed to Bethlehem to see, and they're they saw what God had declared, that specificity was an encouragement to them. So also for us, we should be encouraged. I believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that Jesus is God in the flesh. I believe that he was crucified and died. I believe that he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven and sat down at the Father's right hand. I believe that he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. This should also be an encouragement, not just to us that we believe specific signs, that our faith rests in specific historical events, but it should also be an encouragement to us in evangelism. In verse 17, it says that the shepherds told others what they had seen. It says, when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And this, this refers specifically to, uh, they told Mary and Joseph and in, anyone else there, an angel told us we would see this, and so they're speaking specifically to Mary and Joseph and anyone around. But I want to gather from this a, a general point, that evangelism is not teaching someone systematic theology. Well, I can't, I can't evangelize because I don't know how to persuade people of the five points of Calvinism or the solas of the Reformation or the doctrines of grace. I don't even know what all the doctrines of grace might be. So I can't, I can't evangelize. But you see, evangelism is giving specific signs to the faith of others or giving specific, calling others to faith in specific signs. Evangelism is saying, you must know. God was born of a virgin. God was born in our nature. God was born, God incarnate. And this God in the flesh was crucified as a substitute for sinners. This God in the flesh was raised from the dead. This God in the flesh ascended to heaven and has, has sat down there and will return to judge the world. When you tell people that, that is the gospel, that is the good news, the good tidings of great joy, and those are the specific signs in which their faith can rest. Those are the specific signs in which they are called and to which they are commanded to believe. And we can understand those things, and we can declare those things. Well, I don't know how to convince people of all the philosophy and systematic theology of, of the scriptures. As important as those things are, that's not what evangelism is. Evangelism is believe in the incarnation. 
Believe in the crucifixion. Believe in the resurrection. Believe in the ascension and session of Jesus. Believe in the second coming of our Lord. And when we give that to our loved ones at Christmas, when we give that to our neighbor or our friend or our coworker, then what are they forced to do? To believe it or not to believe it? I don't believe that God was born in the flesh. I don't believe that he was crucified. I don't believe that he, ra- that he rose from the dead. I don't believe he ascended into heaven and sat down at the Father's right hand. I don't believe that he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. You see, now the person is not debating five points of Calvinism with you. The person is rejecting the truths of the gospel. God gives our faith specific signs. And this is an encouragement to us that we believe in specific history. It's also an encouragement to us to declare those things because that's what faith rests in. Thirdly, we see in these verses in the third place, God's grace is given to all who believe. God's grace is is given to all who believe. The angel tells the shepherds that these good news, that this, these good tidings of great joy, he says, are for all the people. The good news of God's incarnation and everything that will come from it are for all the people. But how does one benefit from this good news? How does one receive a benefit from these great and glad tidings. Well, it's by believing in that message. It's by believing in those, that good news, that gospel, those good tidings. Because the scriptures say, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And those who confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead. Those ones will be saved. Those who call on his name, those who confess him as Lord, those who believe in their heart in his resurrection, which of course implies his crucifixion previously and his incarnation antecedently to that. It is those ones who believe in these specific signs. It is those who who believe who receive God's grace. And God's grace is given freely to all who believe. Look at verse 14 with me. This is a verse with a various, uh, a diverse history of translation. In the ESV, I believe it is, pro- in this case, it is properly translated, where it says that the angel announces that the, the birth of this child, what does it mean? It means glory to God and peace on earth to men in whom he is pleased. Many times, especially in American Christmas culture, which is often, as much as we love it, very silly. Christmas is often treated as a time of peace for all. Jesus has been born, so peace for everyone and such things. Well, it doesn't take too much thought to realize that's just not true at all. (laughs) But sometimes they would draw that from an older translation, which would say something like, glory to God and peace on earth and to men goodwill, which, of course, the incarnation of Jesus, the good news, is good news for all peoples. However, what I want to emphasize is that there is peace for, for whom? Who receives peace on earth? It is men in whom God is pleased. Who are the men in whom God is pleased? With whom is God pleased on earth? It's not the rich. It's not the famous. It's not the influential. It's not the popular. It's those who believe. Those who receive his son. God is pleased with those who receive his son by faith. John chapter 1, the word became flesh, and he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, to those who did believe in him, he gave them the right to be called the sons of God. God's grace, God's peace is given to all who believe. God is pleased with those who believe in his son and receive his son by faith. And we see this. In the fact that the very day that Jesus is born, simple, humble men such as shepherds are are the first recipients of the good news. The angel says, this day has been born this child. 
And we're told he was laid in the manger. The angel says, you'll see him in the manger. It says they saw him in the manger, which means that the time from which Jesus is actually born into this world to the time that the shepherds see him is extremely short. They see him almost immediately. And who are the recipients of God's gospel? Who are the recipients of the, the good tidings of great and gladsome joy? Simple, humble shepherds. Shepherds live outside. They work with animals. They're regarded as kind of dirty people. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 43 uses shepherds as an illustration of cleaning something nasty. It says that God will cleanse the land as a shepherd cleans his cloak of vermin. <laughs> shepherds are regarded as having um, clothing with vermin in it. Why? Because they're just outside. They can't wash their clothes. They're, they're kind of dirty people. Now, the concept of a shepherd or the idea of a shepherd is very positive throughout the scriptures. That the Lord is my shepherd. And so I'm not saying that shepherds had a negative connotation in, in Israel. In, it, in Egypt, they did. Remember when Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt and the Egyptians said, you go live in Goshen. And it says, because shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians. Well, shepherd is a consistently positive concept in, in the Old Testament. The point is that they're simple humble, common folk. And these simple, humble, common folk are the first recipients, the first recipients of the good news of the birth of Jesus. And they believe it so quickly. They believe it so immediately. They, they rush to Bethlehem to see this thing that had been reported to them. Come, let us go. It's often the rich and the influential and the popular and the well-educated at times, it's often those persons that say, well, I don't know, well, I don't think so, or I don't want to, because they're so distracted by all of those blessings that they've received. That it, that's why Jesus says it's hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God, but these simple, humble, common shepherds, they believe immediately. God's grace is given to all who believe, everyone, even me, yes, to you, if you believe you too will receive God's saving grace that comes from this Son, this Jesus, this Savior Christ and Lord. Fourthly, we see in the fourth place, God's mighty deeds should cause us to ponder and praise. God's mighty deeds should cause us to ponder and praise. If you read Luke 2, 1 through 20, and you pay attention to human emotions, you'll see a wide range of responses on the part of humans to what God does and what God says in this passage. We see fear, wonder, amazement, pondering, glory, and praise. But I want to focus in on verses 18 through 20. So the shepherds arrive... They see the child. They tell Mary and Joseph and the others, we were, we were told specifically that we would find a child in a manger. And here he is. And in verse 18 and following, it says, And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They were, the people were saying, that's amazing. They're marveling. Verse 19, But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Remember last week, seven days ago, it was a long time ago. Last week I said that the things that astonish us should also assure us. Zechariah was astonished by the appearance of the angel, and yet he was assured by the sign of his muteness that what had been promised would take place, etc. Here I'm making the same point, but with different words. God's mighty deeds should cause us to ponder and praise. In these verses, some people wonder and marvel at God's mighty deeds. Look at what God has done. Look at what God has said and fulfilled. Mary treasures them up and ponders them in her heart. Mary's response is to meditate on these things. This was quite a day for Mary. <laughs> Mary's giving birth in a strange place 
in an uncomfortable place with where animals are housed, if, where mangers are, animals are, because animals eat from mangers. She's giving birth to her first child. She's, she's, it's not like she knew what it was like to give birth. She's giving birth for the first time in a strange place. She doesn't know the people around her, likely. And it's at night, and there are animals around. She's been traveling, and she gives birth, and then people show up. And they say, we were told about this. We want to see the child. She would probably say, could you give me a minute? (laughs) Could you please let me recover from giving birth to a child? Remember, the child is laid in a manger, and the shepherds see the child while he's still in the manger. Very quickly. And so Mary, what is her response to this? Her response is to... Probably a wise response. She's just treasuring the things in her heart. And it says pondering them. She's meditating. Meditating on what God has done. Now, Mary's coming to this with a good amount of previous knowledge. The angel had appeared to her and told her, you're going to conceive. The child will be the child of the Most High. The angel had appeared to Joseph and told Joseph, don't divorce her. She is, she is pregnant of the Holy Spirit. Mary also had visited her, her uh, excuse me, cousin, Elizabeth. I, I don't remember the exact family relationship, excuse me. She had, mar- uh, she had visited Elizabeth. She had found that Elizabeth w- was with child in her old age and the birth of John the Baptist. So Mary comes to this with a good deal of knowledge already, but as more is added, she didn't know that the shepherds would be told. She didn't know that shepherds would come. How does she respond to God's mighty deeds and God's wonderful words as she receives them? She treasures them up and she ponders them in her heart. That is a good response. That is a right response to what she is experiencing. And it should encourage us to Christian meditation. In our our culture, in popular culture around us, meditation is usually regarded as emptying the mind. One meditates by empty your mind of all stresses and cares and concerns, etc., and you sort of meditate in an emptiness. That's not meditation in the biblical sense. Meditation in the biblical sense is to have something specific in mind and to consider that thing, to ponder it, to meditate upon it. And so Mary treasures these things up. She, she hides them in her heart. She remembers them, and then she thinks about them. I encourage you to do the same, to to treasure these things in your heart and to ponder them. What you could do is to, during the week, you could write down some of your thoughts. If you, if you, meditation is a discipline that you really have to train yourself to do. Our minds are so easily distracted that if your meditation is just mental, it's so easy to just be distracted. But if you take the time to write down some thoughts, what does the incarnation mean for me? Not what does the incarnation mean to me. We don't get to decide what it means. It is what it is. But how does the incarnation apply to me? How does the incarnation benefit me? How can I respond to the incarnation? If you just take some time to jot down some of those responses, you will be meditating on or pondering these wonderful things, these wonderful words and mighty deeds of God. And that's, that's a wonderful way to spend your time. We, we tend to think of uh, devotions or devotional life as I have my quiet time and here it is in my day. And that's a good thing. That's a good discipline. But we should also remember that we can treasure these th- things up in our hearts and ponder them throughout the day, any day, all day. Whether we are doing something or going somewhere, we have a storehouse. We have a, a treasury of God's words and God's deeds to ponder and to meditate on throughout the day. Now, if one meditates on God's mighty deeds and wonderful words, if one fills the heart and treasures up such things, what will happen? From the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we fill ourselves with meditation on God's wonderful words and God's mighty deeds, we will be led to praise and to worship. And that's how the shepherds responded. They went away from there praising God and worshiping him. It says they were glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. The shepherd's response is also a wonderful response. 
And you can sing hymns of praise in your car. You can, you can say hymns of praise. You can pray and praise God in your mind. Part of prayer is to praise God. So worship the Lord your God. Praise him. Sing his marvelous deeds. Do we shrug our shoulders at the incarnation and say, yeah, I know. I know it's God in the flesh. Yes, that's great. But where's my presence? Children, is Christmas about presence for you first and foremost? You have to realize American Christmas, cultural Christmas, and the incarnation of God are two different things. We celebrate cultural Christmas because it's fun and nice and we enjoy it. Have a tree, buy presents if you want to. That's, that's Christmas. That's a thing that we like to do. That should never, ever take the place of the incarnation of God and our worship unto God for his incarnation for us and our salvation. And to the degree that such a thing as a celebration of Christmas would take the place of that, then it becomes an idol. And it must be then chopped down and burnt. <laughs> iconoclasm destroy the idols and so children if your fascination with christmas is more dealing with sugar and wrapping paper then you need to adjust and change your thinking such things are fun and they're enjoyable and they're fine in their own place but the real reason for the season as cheesy as that sounds it's true the incarnation of god is a wonder which should bring us to meditation, to ponder, and to praise God. Do not shrug at the incarnation. Ponder God's mighty deeds and praise him for them. Fifthly and lastly, and we will conclude with this point. Number five, heaven and hell are closer than you think. Heaven and hell are closer than you think. You might ask, where does this come from in the text? Well, consider with me the phrase, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And suddenly a heavenly host appeared and the angels went away into heaven. These things are a reminder to us that God created the world with a visible and an invisible realm. And the invisible realm of creation is not far away, it's invisible. And this has implications for our understanding of reality. So that when the glory of the Lord appeared around the shepherds, What's really happening is that the line between visible and invisible reality is being crossed and suddenly a portion of heaven is now on earth. And now the shepherds are suddenly in heaven while on earth at the same time. And the glory of the Lord shines around them because they are in that place. And then their vision of the invisible world is expanded as suddenly the heavenly host appears around them as well. It's a reminder that The movement from visible to invisible is not a faraway journey. Heaven and hell are not far away from us. They're closer than you think. It's here. It's right before us. It's it's beyond our comprehension because of our human limitations of experience and knowledge. We, We know existence as we know it as visible created creatures. And yet the scriptures are full of telling us about the invisible world. And in this case, this is why and how the angel just appears, just walks through that veil. The angel just walks right through the veil of invisibility, and suddenly heaven is there. The scriptures describe this as unfurling a scroll, just rolling it back, just rolling back that dividing line between visible and invisible. Now, what would our daily life be like if we were sensitive to this reality, would we not 
contemplate perhaps more our mortality and eternity as we realize that the invisible realm, heaven and hell, are not far away. They're right here, but behind that veil. How would we worship and pray knowing that heaven is just behind that veil? How would we live knowing that God is not aloof? We might think, when the cat's away, the mice will play, and heaven is far away. No. Heaven is right before us, around us. The invisible world is just as real as the... The invisible world is just as real as the visible. It's just invisible. I have to ask you, therefore, when you enter that invisible realm... When your soul is separated from your body at death, your body will remain here on earth, your soul will enter that invisible realm. Which part of the invisible realm will your soul enter? Will it enter through that veil into heaven and glory and light, the glory of the Lord? Or will you enter into confinement, imprisonment, torment, and judgment? You see, the answer to that question depends on one's relation to this child in the manger. He is Savior, Christ, and Lord, and he came to save his people from their sins. And those in whom God is well pleased, those who believe in the Son, those who receive him by faith, they will enter that joy and that light and that life everlasting. They will enter into heaven. Their soul will cross through that veil with joy. Their soul will enter into eternal life because Jesus has already done what? Remember the specific signs, incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and then what? Ascension where? Session where? In heaven. He has entered that invisible heavenly realm for us already and sat down there. So we know that when I die, when my soul is separated from my body, I will be there with him because he is already there. Jesus is God in the flesh, Savior Christ and Lord. And all who believe in him, all who call on his name, will be saved. Heaven is theirs because Jesus entered for us in our flesh the heavenly holy of of holies. And we will never see hell because Jesus has saved us from it. Heaven and hell are closer than you think. But for all those who trust in Jesus and call on his name, This is a cause for joy, not for fear. It is a comfort. Indeed, it is good tidings of great joy for all the people. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you knowing that you are not far away, knowing that you are not aloof, knowing that you hear us for Jesus' sake, and how we thank you for the incarnation of our Lord how we thank you for all that he has done for us and for our salvation. Oh Lord, please help us to live with a consciousness, with an awareness of the reality of the invisible realm and our necessary entrance, our inevitable entrance into it one day. Oh Lord, how we thank you for our Savior, how we thank you for our Christ, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We praise you. We meditate on your works, and we ask you to help us to be diligent in meditation. Help us to treasure up these words and to ponder them throughout the day, to feed on them throughout the week. We thank you that you have given to our faith such specific signs for us to treasure and to ponder and to benefit from. And we ask you to receive our praises, to receive our adoration and worship this morning. Oh Lord, thank you for all you have done for us. We praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.